Hello, and welcome to lecture one of the preliminaries unit in Phys 1104. And since this is probably the first video lecture you're watching in the course, welcome to Phys 1104. This first unit is called preliminaries because it's dealing with a few things that aren't really physics, but are important to the course. And so we kind of need to get them out of the way before we dive into the physics. I'm sure you've seen the scientific method in earlier courses, but it deserves repetition. And I'm going to be structuring these video lectures to go from sets of observations to hypotheses as much as possible. So I'm trying to mimic part of the scientific method in the structure of these video lectures. So it's worth going over it. So in the scientific method, we have some observations. And we try and look for patterns in them to figure out rules. This is called inductive reasoning. Those rules we formulate into a hypothesis. And once you have your hypothesis, you can use it to make predictions. So you predict what will happen in some specific case. And that allows you to design an experiment and test whether your prediction was correct. If your prediction wasn't correct, then you have to go back and revise your hypothesis. And you just keep doing this, refining your hypothesis each time you go around this cycle. Observations could mean many things. They could be that we're going out into nature and seeing what's out there, but it could also be careful lab experiments where we're keeping certain things well controlled and varying other things in a way that we know. A hypothesis unavoidably has underlying assumptions, and then it is a mental model. And you use mental models in your everyday life, whether you're doing science or not. For example, just using your cell phone, you have a mental model that when you press a certain part of the screen, you predict what will happen. A prediction is then about how the model will behave in some certain well-defined situation, which allows you to design your test. And so all of this is what we would call provisional knowledge. All scientific knowledge is provisional. We're constantly revising it in light of new observations. Not all hypotheses are equally scientific. And so you might ask what's required for a hypothesis to be scientific. The main requirement is that it has to be testable by observation or experiment. And in particular, it's certainly not a scientific hypothesis if it's impossible to disprove. In one word, we say that a hypothesis must be falsifiable, which just means possible to disprove. Let's take three hypotheses just to practice thinking about whether they satisfy the conditions necessary to be scientific. So pause the video and read these three hypotheses about life on Mars and decide whether you think they're scientific or not. Okay, so hopefully you've done that. Let's look at the first one. Well, that one's perfectly scientific. You can check, you can send probes to Mars and see whether there are giant cities and canals there and beings living in those cities. We've done that. And so we know that while this hypothesis is perfectly scientific, it's also false. Single-celled organisms below the surface, that's perfectly scientific. Again, you can send probes or you can go there yourself and try and find them. And this is consistent with current knowledge, but for all we know, this could also be false. Being so small that they're undetectable by any means, well, there's no way to disprove that. If they're undetectable by any means, then how would you ever disprove this? And so this one is unscientific. Now the middle one with the single-celled organisms might be bothering you because how do you disprove it? How do you disprove that those organisms are there? Surely you could always say, well, we just haven't looked hard enough. Well, that's true, but you can always go on the balance of current evidence and decide whether you believe the hypothesis. This is sort of like the Sasquatch. There's nothing unscientific with the hypothesis that the Sasquatch exists. But on the basis of current evidence, it wouldn't be particularly scientific to believe that it exists. Similarly, physicists have good theoretical reasons to think that a thing called a magnetic monopole might exist. 
but people have been looking for them in many, many experiments for a very long time, and we've never seen even one. And so, currently, we believe that they don't exist. So these are scientifically testable hypotheses. However, you might always have to revise your decision. A Sasquatch could walk into downtown Seattle tomorrow, and we would have to revise, the hypo revise our conclusion about whether it exists. I said that hypotheses always involve assumptions. You might feel that that's a little dicey, basing a hypothesis on assumptions. But realize that when we do tests to test our hypothesis, and if the hypothesis turns out to be incorrect, that may mean that we have to revise our assumptions. So we are actually testing our assumptions. And it could be that the assumptions are wrong and we have to revise them, or perhaps the assumptions are perfectly correct, but the model we've based on them is incorrect. In any case, any hypothesis we form is tentative. We're constantly having to go back and revise it, possibly, if it turns out to make predictions that don't agree with experiment. Now, if predictions from a hypothesis do really well, if they pass many, many tests, and we start to suspect that we can rely on this hypothesis, we may start to call it a theory or a law. And I'll warn you, the distinction between a theory and a law is subtle, and not even all scientists use the two words in the same way, so I wouldn't get hung up on them. But the important thing is that in everyday language, we often use the word theory to mean something kind of like a guess. But it's exactly the opposite in science. A theory is not speculation. It's not a guess. It's an explanation for things, a hypothesis, which has passed many, many tests so that we think that it's a useful model of reality. Most models that we make, hypotheses, involve simplifications. So let's think about the nature of simplification and how it can often get us to more powerful representations of things while ignoring details that are unimportant. So that funny looking creature in the picture is me. And let's say that we are modeling my motion across the room. Well, probably the color of my clothes and my skin and my beard and the background behind me doesn't matter if we're modeling my motion. And so we might start off by thinking of me this way. And you know, unless I'm moving really fast, my exact shape isn't going to matter much, so maybe this is an even better representation of me for the purposes of modeling my motion. And in fact, if we don't really care about where my individual limbs are and so on, but maybe we have to worry about whether I can fit through a doorway or something, maybe this is a perfectly good representation of me. And if we don't even care about that, if all we care about is where I am, then we could pick some representative piece of me and track that and model me like this. So what we're doing here is moving from concrete representations of me towards abstract ones. And in particular, this final one where we think of me as just a single point is a very useful representation, which we call the particle model and we'll be using it all through this course. Since what we're studying is motion, let's talk about, in particular, representations of motion that we'll often use. So I just told you about the particle model, and any time we're just concerned with how an object translates through space, if we don't care about it rotating and we're not worried about how parts of it move in relation to others, then we can get away with using the particle model to represent it. And so, in that case, a useful representation of its motion is just to show where the object was at various different points in time. We'll call this a motion diagram. And the locations are numbered so that you know the order, or you can put arrows on that show which way the thing was going. These would be velocity vectors. Or you can label it with the times instead of just arbitrary numbers. Well, another useful, more powerful perhaps, but also more abstract representation would be a graph 
which describes the motion. This would be a position versus time graph. And then a further abstraction that gets us even more predictive power would be an equation. Now, surely it would be unscientific to keep using theories if we knew that they were incorrect. Well, sometimes you'd be surprised. In this course, we're going to study a lot of different theories, but they all sort of fit together into one big theory called Newtonian mechanics. Newtonian mechanics is extremely well verified by hundreds of years of experiments, but I hate to tell you this, it's wrong. It's wrong. Well, Newtonian mechanics turns out to be inaccurate either for very small objects like atoms or for objects moving near the speed of light. But notice, a lot of the time we're not dealing with those situations. And as long as we're not dealing with those situations, Newtonian mechanics is an extremely good approximation and it's a lot easier to use than the other theories that do work for small objects or things moving near the speed of light. And so we continue to use Newtonian mechanics even though it's wrong. As I'm going to explain in a moment, symmetry is going to turn out to be important to us. And so I thought I'd just explain a little bit about symmetry. I'm sure you have an idea of what symmetry is, but you might never have thought about it this way. Think about this happy face and what happens when we flip it from top to bottom, or in other words, if you reflect it in this horizontal mirror line. Well, it clearly changes. On the other hand, if, we, if, if you reflect it in this vertical mirror line, it appears exactly the same as it was at the beginning. If you rotate it 90 degrees, then it changes. So what this is showing us is that it's symmetric right to left. A symmetry is some change that you can try out and try to carry out on something which leaves the thing appearing unchanged. So similarly, you can verify that this rug appears unchanged if you reflect it through this mirror line or this mirror line or if you rotate it 180 degrees. So those are symmetries of this rug. Why does this matter? Well, it's actually a very deep thing that comes from a mathematician who you probably haven't heard of but should. More people should hear about Emmy Nutter. Nutter's theorem, which applies to things like Newtonian mechanics and quantum mechanics, tells us that symmetries correspond to conservation laws. What does that mean? Well, it means that when we have a physical law and we find that there's a symmetry, it tells us about a conservation law. So one symmetry we know is that if you change where your axes are, oh, we've just changed something, but our physical law remains unchanged when we do that. And so our physical law has a symmetry. It turns out that symmetry, translational invariance, corresponds to conservation of momentum. Similarly, as time goes on, our physical law doesn't change. It has time invariance, and that, Nutter's theorem tells us, is the reason for conservation of energy. Having talked about conservation laws and symmetry and things not changing, now we need to talk about when things do change and how we define a change in a quantity. So as an example, let's take a bank balance. And suppose on Monday your bank balance is $400 and on Tuesday your bank balance is $600. You would write that your change in your bank balance, since I'm using B for bank balance, I'll call this delta B. Delta means change in. I think we all agree the change in your bank balance was $200. Well, from Tuesday to Wednesday, it went from 600 to 300. Well, you could say that your delta B was $300, but I think we want to distinguish between your bank balance going up and down. I certainly prefer to be able to distinguish between my bank balance going up and down. So it makes more sense to say that this one is negative $300. So this now lets us get a definition. Our change in our bank balance from some initial time to some final time is always the final value minus the initial value. And calculating it that way will give you consistent results with this. And so this is how we will always define a change in any quantity. 
it is always the final value minus the initial value, where note that we have to change what we mean by final and initial from time to time as we're dealing with different events.